All right, thank you everyone for letting me present on the uh, minimally invasive L5-S1 lateral A-lift approach. And uh, as a disclaimer, um, this is an approach that I do myself. So I know that uh, historically, especially for A-lift and supine A-lift, uh, this is an approach that vascular surgeons will use or you'll get the assistance of your general surgeons. But as we move to the lateral positioning, um, there are some surgeons like myself who have learned this approach. And, uh, you know, I do think that I consider myself within good company. Uh, you know, Bill and Juan and Luis for some time began describing the lateral approaches for thoracal lumbar junction and then the uh, lateral lumbar interbody fusion. And this is a, um, a screenshot of Juan uh, a few years ago with a little bit less white hair, uh, describing, you know, when he asked his uh, general and thoracic surgeons to, to do the approach for him. And then naturally, as we started to take uh, and understand this approach more, these incisions uh, became much, much smaller. And this is no different with the lateral A-lift approach as well. I mean, with supine A-lift, it's a wonderful uh, way to get down to the spine, but oftentimes the general and vascular surgeons really care about seeing all the anatomy. But I don't need to see all of it, right? All I need to see is the disc space. And so then you get to something like on the bottom right-hand corner, and then your incisions also start to get smaller as well, especially for a single level disease. And so in this particular case, as we all know, ALIF is king, right? You have the largest uh, inner body footprint. You have the largest uh, uh, amount of correction. You can see here the ALIF king presiding over subjects. And so the whole idea then is, as you can see, releasing that annulus gives an unprecedented power to provide a lot of correction, right? And this is distraction, indirect decompression, restoration of lordosis. And this is even more important when we're talking about minimally invasive deformity, right? So as an overview for this talk, I'm going to go over cases on why this is important. We're going to go over the you know, most important parts of the anatomy within the, the time constraints that we have here today, and then the technique on actually how to do it. So in terms of cases, this was presented earlier on the talk when I introduced adult spinal deformity, right? So we have this lady. She's got a mismatch of 45 degrees, pelvic tilt of 31. She's 420 centimeters, but her age is 77. Right? And so when you start to think of uh, folks who are a little bit more elderly, when you have something like this, a purely lateral approach, right? You can see here restoration of her sagittal balance. Those bottom two cages are lateral A-lift cages. And when you think of a minimally invasive deformity correction, these are her incisions, right? So you have a two and a quarter inch incision up at the top, two and a quarter inch at the bottom. And through these small incisions, we're able to get five inner body spacers um, and the correction we're able to get is because of those lateral A-lift um, cages at the bottom. This is the second case. Again, we presented, uh, I presented this earlier, mismatch of 44 degrees, tilt of 39. She's got a 53 degree curve. And you can see her coronal correction here, as well as her sagittal correction here. And again, at the bottom, you have two lateral A-lift cages, right? Four, five, and five, one. And you can see for a patient whose body habitus is a little bit bigger, really minimizing the risk profile because we have a three inch incision where you can put four lateral inner body spacers and then a two and a half inch incision for those lateral elip cages at the bottom so really powerful way to correct um, you have this uh, particular patient as well so uh you know the um limbus vertebrae at uh, l5 and you have a mismatch of 49 degrees tilt of 30 and again you can see here um her uh, deformity uh, every other disc space above that is perfectly normal, right? So three, four, two, three, one, two, all perfectly normal. And with lateral approaches, you really have an opportunity to provide that much correction, right? So you have essentially the crux of this entire symposium. You have an oblique four, five ACR, and then lateral a lift at five, one, and you're really able to get a minimally invasive uh, correction uh, for this person. And then lastly, we have this patient. Um, again, a mismatch of 52 degrees, right? You're starting to get to the edges of a minimally invasive deformity correction, but still possible. Tilt of 32, she's 4 at 16 centimeters. Her PI is 79, right? So her prior surgery at 4.5 with the T-lift really flattened her out and uh, set her uh, into this situation. But again, a BMI of 38. But with this, you can see here an incredible amount of correction with two ACRs at 2, 3, 3, 4, lateral A-lift at 5.1, you get that restoration and match of her lumbar lordosis of 78 degrees to her PI of 79, and then you get um, these incisions for her, right? So a three inch incision at the top for those two ACRs, and then a two and a half inch for that very large A-lift cage at the bottom. 
you get complete restoration of her sagittal alignment through a minimally invasive approach. So um, what is the important anatomy, right? So naturally, when you think of the ALIF approach, we all know that you work through the vascular bifurcations. And the most important part of this, and you know, you can fill an entire talk about the anatomy here, the most important part, especially for spine surgeons, is the left common iliac vein, right, the LCIV. And that's because that's the one that is most um, vulnerable to injury, especially when you're doing a discectomy and cage placement. So when you think of the types of uh, veins to look for, this is what you want to avoid, right, when the LCIV is right at the center. So you take a look at the left-hand screen, that's what the LCIV would look like on your axial MRI. And of course, you're in lateral, which can be a lot more disorienting. So the really number one thing to look for is patient selection, right, to keep yourself safe. So this is what you're, you should be looking for, a type 1 LCIV where the veins are widely split and there is a fat pad underneath, right? So here's an example of widely split and bifurcated uh, left common iliac vein. Here's another one, widely split. Another one, very widely split. These are very favorable approaches, right, to do um, to access the uh, L5-S1 disc space between the blood vessels. This is one where you may not want to do right uh, yourself right and the the risk of a left common iliac vein injury is going to be higher here's another one you can see here the vein is right in front of the disc space and really plastered and stretched across the disc space which really increases the risk of injury um, during that uh, retraction and then here the bifurcation is right in front of you so this is an approach where unfortunately an a lift whether supine or lateral may not be the best and you may just have to go posterior uh, for this patient so there's a lot of things to look for in terms of anatomy but in the time constraints of the symposium, my takeaway for you is really looking at that left common iliac vein. So when you take a look at all your patients in MRIs, um, start looking for this, and you may start to see patients where you may um, want to consider and think about doing this yourself. So technique, how is this done? The patient is positioned in right lateral decubitus, which is left side up, right? So this is an example of that. You see two uh, axial tape uh, rolls around the patient to make sure they're rigid. And you can see here that left leg is completely straight. This is to make sure that you have enough airspace for your hands to work right down uh, at that um, groin and inguinal line and um, to get uh, things out of the way. You can see here another view of that. I've marked out the ASIS, um, that uh, groin wrinkle, as well as the lateral rectus sheath. So your incisions are going to be um, in between that space. Now, this particular patient was done single position for a DGEN, so I was doing a one or two level. So their back is positioned all the way to the edge of the bed. But if you're doing this for deformity, I will typically put them uh, at the center of the bed with two rolls just to stabilize them at the front and at the back. You can see here um, what the incision looks like. So L5-S1 disc space is marked at the top. You have the sacral slope, the perpendicular line going down. And your incision is going to be in between this uh, lateral to the rectus sheath in front of the ASIS. You can see marked here. I've marked the incision. This is about like four to five centimeters. In reality, the incision is typically about six at the minimum, just to make sure you get the appropriately sized cage uh, down at L5-S1. When you open up the skin and you get down to the external oblique fascia, when you open that up, the first thing you'll see are the fibers of the external oblique muscle. When you open those fibers, you will be in the retroperitoneal space. You, so you can see in the bottom left-hand uh, inset, the yellow arrow is where we're at right now. Right, So that's the retroperitoneal fat. The blue arrow is where we're going to be. But the retroperitoneal fat is a key landmark because this is going to be swept downwards uh, uh, more uh, anteriorly so that you can get uh, down to the next anatomic landmark, which is the psoas muscle. So again, if you look at the, uh, uh, the bottom left-hand inset, you'll see the psoas muscle. And this is important because this tells you that you're on the right direction. You want to be sure all of that retroperitoneal fat and peritoneum is swept all the way in front of you. When you see that psoas, you can see that if you go just for medial, you're going to see the left common iliac artery, right? That artery is just like the carotid when you're doing an ACDF, right? So it is a waypoint so you can continue on more medial. Once you see the common iliac artery, you're going to see the vein just medial to that. So you see the left uh, lower inset. You know that the vein lives just medial to that. Naturally, check your MRI to make sure that the anatomy is what you would expect. But this is what that anatomy looks like. So you have the psoas, you have the pulsating uh, left common iliac artery, and just medial to that, you have the left common iliac vein. Now, understandably, 
seeing something pulsating in the wound may be cause for uh, pause and hesitation for a spine surgeon. But uh, naturally, this is really analogous to doing an ACDF. So when you're doing an ACDF, you're going in, you're working by the trachea, the esophagus, the carotid, the carotid sheath, lots of non-spine structures. But if you understand that anatomy, the trajectory and approach um, is very safe. And so you can see here, once you identify these blood vessels, just like in that inset at the bottom, put your retractor underneath, protect them, and you'll be at the S1 sacral promontory. So right here is the sacral promontory. You have the disc space right in the front. Once you set your retractors in place, here's the uh, incision itself, right? It's about six centimeters, five centimeters for the opening. And then you do your discectomy. You complete it. You put in your cage, right? Uh, I do it under fluoro just to make sure everything's appropriate. And then you remove the retractor. Right. So naturally, of course, there are a lot of nuances, a lot of courses you can go to to understand um, all of this anatomy. But in a nutshell, that's pretty much what it is. And here's the incision for single level. So if you're doing degen, it's about, you know, say, seven centimeters, just a shy of three inches. But like I showed you earlier, if this forms the base of a larger minimally invasive deformity correction, then you get multiple small incisions, right? Two and a half inches at the top, two and a half inches at the bottom. This was an L1 to S1 earlier. Here's a T12 to S1 earlier. This is uh, an L2 to S1, right? So two ACRs at the top, five one at the bottom. This was one that I had presented earlier, but L1 to S1. Again, multiple um, minimally invasive small incisions to get an incredible amount of correction. This is what it may look like in the operating room. This was an L2 to S1. You have an incision at the bottom, L45, L5 S1 that's already complete. And here I'm doing an oblique approach for two, three, and three, four to get in the other uh, cages uh, higher up in the lumbar spine. And again, you see with the flat L5 S1 disc space, an A lift approach, there's really no comparison being able to distract and restore that amount of lordosis that's there. Right? And you see for a minimally invasive approach, right, the A lift is really king in being able to give people a base. And especially for deformity correction, you have a strong base at L5-S1, which we all know has a higher propensity for pseudoarthrosis and failure. But now you have a large A-lift cage there for a strong fusion. Okay. So again, in conclusion, lateral A-lift, um, minimally invasive approach to that junction because your only other alternative is a T-lift, which is good in um, you know, posterior only surgery and it is very safe. But especially if you're considering A-lift for minimally invasive um, uh, philosophies and, and approaches, you know, I would um, uh, tell you to really consider it as a part of your technique and armamentarium. So uh, thanks for your time and uh, looking forward to the rest of uh, this symposium.